Okay, this is discussion two, three on periodic trends. So we're gonna talk about really four different trends down a group from top to bottom and across a period from left to right, and we're gonna explain why these trends exist. So atomic radius is basically just a measure of the size of an atom. Technically, we measure it as half of the distance between two neighboring nuclei, uh, but really the radius of an atom, okay? I'm not gonna test you on that specific definition. Now, as we go down a group from top to bottom, it increases. So if you look at group two, barium is much larger than beryllium. So let's think about why this is. As we go down a group, we're adding more energy levels. So basically shells of electrons, and this makes it larger and larger. You can imagine this with yourself, right? If I put on a light jacket, and then I put on another coat and another coat and another coat and another coat on top of that, I'm gonna get bigger and bigger and bigger. Now, as we go across a period, this is a little bit less intuitive. So as I go from left to right across a period, the atoms actually get smaller. So this shows period two from lithium to fluorine, and they're actually getting smaller, which is really surprising because you might think, well, I'm adding more stuff to them. Shouldn't they be getting bigger? Well, Consider that we're not adding any new energy levels. So both lithium and fluorine have two occupied energy levels. However, we are increasing the protons in the nucleus. So those protons are pulling the electrons more strongly. The electrons are feeling more of a positive pull from the nucleus, so they actually get smaller as you go from left to right across a period. So using a periodic table, when you try to figure out which element is the largest, lithium, francium, fluorine, or astatine, okay? And when you're ready to hear the answer, press play. So of these elements, I know it's gonna have to be something that is near the bottom of the table because they're gonna have more energy levels. And I also know that it gets smaller as you go across a period. So basically, the largest atoms are going to be in the bottom left of the periodic table. So in this case, francium would be the correct answer. Let's talk about ionization energy. So this isn't a term we've heard before. So the first thing we have to do is define this term. So ionization energy is the amount of energy that's requir required to remove one electron from the outer energy level of an atom in the gas phase. So basically, how hard is it to take an electron from an atom? The units of this are kilojoules per mole. Now, kilojoules, you probably know the joules are a unit of energy. Mole is a way of counting a large number of atoms. We'll talk about that later. But hopefully for now, you could just recognize, ah, I see kilojoules, it must be ionization energy. Now, as I go down a group, the ionization energy decreases. So it's easier to take an electron from calcium than it is to take an electron from beryllium. You can see that with the numbers there. So let's think about why it is that it's easier to take an electron from calcium to beryllium. Okay, so I want you to imagine that you have something that someone else wants, okay? If I have something that I'm trying to keep away from someone, am I gonna hold it really close to myself or am I gonna extend my arm and hold it as far away from me as possible? I'm gonna hold it close to myself, right? So as the valence electrons get further from the nucleus, they're further from the positive pull of the nucleus, and so it's a lot easier to remove them. We also have something that comes into play called the shielding effect. So the core electrons, which are electrons in the inner energy level, so not valence electrons, are actually blocking the pull of the nucleus. So when we look at calcium, calcium has four total occupied energy levels. So the three inner levels are all shielding the nucleus from pulling on its outer energy levels. In beryllium, we only have two occupied energy levels. So there's only one core level of electrons that's blocking the pull of the nucleus. And we're gonna see the shielding effect come back into play again in a minute. Oop. So in short, the more energy levels there are, the lower the ionization energy, and so it's easier to remove electrons. All right, so 
I want you to look at these elements in group 15 and tell me what has the greatest value for ionization energy. All right, so nitrogen is at the top of the group and we know that ionization energy decreases down a group. So nitrogen has the greatest value for ionization energy of these options. Okay, now which has the greatest shielding effect? Lithium, beryllium, sodium, or potassium? So pause for a moment and see if you can figure it out. So the correct answer here is potassium because it has the most occupied energy levels. Lithium and beryllium are in the same period, so they actually have the same shielding effect. Sodium has a slightly larger shielding effect and potassium is the largest. Now, as we go across a period, the ionization energy increases. So think back to atomic radius. When we talked about atomic radius across a period, we considered that the energy levels were staying the same, but the protons were increasing. That's also a factor here. So ionization energy increases because again, I have the same number of energy levels, but I have more protons pulling on those electrons in the outer energy level. So that means it's much harder to remove an electron. So fluorine's like a bodybuilder and lithium's like a baby, okay? It's much easier to take something from a baby than a bodybuilder. So fluorine, all those protons keep a really good grip on those valence electrons. Very hard to take an electron from fluorine. Okay, and that's because again, it has a very strong nuclear charge, lots of protons. All right, so I want you to tell me which of these has the smallest value for ionization energy, lithium, sodium, potassium, or rubidium. So these are all in the same group. And again, ionization energy decreases going down, so rubidium would have the smallest value. Now, ionization energy is related to losing electrons. Cations are positively charged ions that are formed by an atom losing electrons. And in the next unit, we're going to really look at cations and anions and how they come together. So which groups have low ionization energy? Groups one and two, right? Because ionization energy increases as we go across a period. And so what do these elements need to do to be like a noble gas? They need to lose one or two electrons. So things like sodium, potassium, and rubidium will lose one electron because they have low ionization energy. Beryllium, magnesium, calcium will lose two electrons because they also have low ionization energies. Our last trend is electronegativity, our last major trend. And this is a relative measure of an atom's ability to attract electrons. It's unitless. It's just a relative quantity. They're compared to each other, so we don't have any units for it. Now, as I go down a group, electronegativity decreases. And that's because, again, there's more shielding down a group. So iodine has so many more occupied energy levels than fluorine. So all those energy levels are blocking the nucleus from being able to attract more electrons, whereas fluorine only has two occupied energy levels, so there's much less shielding around the nucleus. So it's much easier for fluorine to attract more electrons, okay? So as the shielding effect increases, it's harder for the nucleus to attract electrons, and so it has a lower electronegativity value. All right, so I want you to try to pick the series that shows the correct ranking of electronegativity from smallest to largest. So again, we're looking at the alkali metals. Okay, so the correct answer here is B. Rubidium is at the bottom of the period, so it has the, uh, or excuse me, the bottom of the group, so it has the smallest electronegativity. Lithium is at the top, so it has the highest. Now, as I go across a period, electronegativity increases. Again, this relates to the fact that I have more protons, but the same number of energy levels. Therefore, that stronger nucleus 
makes it easier to attract electrons. Additionally, the atom is smaller, so the nucleus is actually closer to the electrons that it could attract. All right, so I want you to look at these four elements and figure out which has the largest value for electronegativity. So we know that it increases as we go across a period and decreases down a group. So pause and press play when you're ready to go over it. Okay, so when I look at these, they're sort of in a, in a square on the periodic table. And since it increases across and decreases down, the upper right-hand corner of the periodic table will have the greatest electronegativity. So oxygen would be the correct answer here. Now, I think it's also important to note that we don't actually measure electronegativity values for the noble gases because they're very stable and they don't attract electrons. So really, fluorine has the highest electronegativity on the periodic table. So since electronegativity is related to gaining electrons, it explains the formation of anions. Anions are negatively charged ions that are formed when an atom gains electrons. When an atom gains electrons, since they have an, electrons have a negative charge, the atom overall becomes negatively charged. So which groups have high electronegativity? That would be groups 15, 16, and 17. And what do these elements need to do to be like noble gases? Well, they need to gain electrons, and their high electronegativity allows them to do that and be stable. So let's summarize these trends. As I go across, um, across a period, atomic radius decreases, ionization energy and electronegativity increase, and shielding remains the same because I'm not changing the number of energy levels that are occupied. As I go down a group, the atomic radius increases, the ionization energy and electronegativity decrease, and shielding increases. All right, so I have a way to remember these trends. Um, this clip art monster that I created. So this is a pirate snowman. Um, and pirates say R. So this is the trend for atomic radius, R. It increases as you go down. And imagine that that snowman just fell over following the arrow. It would decrease going to the side. This is an IE scream co N. <laughs> Get it? Ionization energy and electronegativity. It decreases down. And when it falls over to the side, it increases across. I don't have a cheesy way to remember shielding effect, just accept conceptually, okay? So those aren't explanations, those are just um, memory tools. Okay, so the last piece of this is the ionic radius. So let's think, which would be larger, sodium or a sodium ion that has lost an electron? So pause for a moment and think about that. So the correct answer is sodium. When sodium loses an electron, it still has the same power in the nucleus, but all of a sudden, the sodium ion has one fewer electron. Not only that, it has one fewer occupied energy level because the sodium ion will have the same electron configuration as neon. All right, so now think about an anion, which would be larger, chlorine or its ion. And the answer here is the ion, because they, again, they have the same number of protons, but the chloride ion has gained an electron. So the same number of protons have more electrons that they have to keep track of, I guess you could say. So ionic ra radius depends on the ratio of protons to electrons. The more protons there are, the smaller it will be. Now, these are isoelectronic, which means that they have the same number of electrons. So calcium has lost two electrons, potassium has lost one, chlorine has gained one, and sulfur has gained two. So they all have the same number of electrons as argon. So I want you to see if you can figure out which would be the smallest and the largest here. 
you're going to need to think about how many protons each of these have since they have the same number of electrons. So press play when you're ready to go over it. Okay, so from smallest to largest, they go calcium ion, potassium ion, argon, chloride ion, and the sulfide ion. So again, these have the same number of electrons, but calcium has the most protons. So the more protons, the more they're gonna pull on those electrons. So calcium would be the smallest, it's the most positive, and sulfur would be the largest because it's the most negative. So the more positive something is, the smaller it's likely to be. Now, in the lab, we are going to talk about chemical reactivity and how that relates to ionization energy and electronegativity. So we're going to think about whether atoms gain or lose electrons and how easily they do that, because that's a major determining factor for reactivity. And if you have any questions, just ask.